The first thing we're going to look at here is the actual pattern itself and the instructions. And this is the pattern cover. And as I said, it's M5112. And on the front, it has the different pictures or drawings. And on the back, you usually or always find the different fabric requirements and size specifications and notions list. You should be able to look at the back of a pattern package and if you're in the store, look at the pattern, know exactly how much fabric you need to buy and any notions such as buttons or zippers or anything like that. So that's what's on the back of the package. When you open um, up, in, in this case with this pattern, there is a general information page. Now, I, I just bought this pattern uh, recently, and I don't think it's a vintage one, but for some reason it's discolored, so maybe it's an old copy or something. But there are diagrams of the different pieces that you can make, and they are lettered um, A through E on that front and back. And then down here, you will also find them listed tunic A, top B, tunic C, shorts D and E, I mean shorts D, capri pants E. And we're going to be making the, cap the capri pants and what's uh, listed under that are two pattern pieces, 16 and 17. So by this you know that both the shorts and the pants are made from the same pattern pieces. Now, um, if you look at the diagram here, these are the two pattern pieces. This would be the length for the shorts halfway up, and this is the length for the pants. So when, if you're cutting out the tissue patterns, what I would do is cut out the length, the full length of the pants, and then fold the bottom half up to the cutting line for the shorts. So if you're going to make the shorts, cut the pattern out for the full length of the pants and then just fold the, the tissue paper up. That way you don't lose um, the second half of the legs if you go to make the pants later on. So that describes the different pieces you need and what they look like. Now up here, um, this area, you, you need to read even if you generally gloss over it like I do. This is where they're going to put any specifics for their particular pattern. Pattern markings, grain line, fold line, cutting line, notches and symbols for the, that they use, finished garment measurements, all of their definitions are here. And these up here are how to make adjustments to the pattern if you need to. Now over here I'm cutting and marking um, and this is why it's good to read it. When you see that symbol which is an H there's a specific way to cut the fabric out and um, not all p patterns will have this much detail and um, these are different, they're not really options when it comes to cutting the actual fabric, but they're little notes, like here, uh, broken line boxes in layouts represent pieces cut by measurements provided. So you really do need, and up here it's in English, down here it's in, I believe, Spanish, um, you do really need to read over all the specifics. After that, there will be cutting layouts for each item. So here is the tunic. They give you two ways to lay it out depending on whether you have 45 inch fabric or 60 inch wide fabric. That one happens to need um, interfacing. I believe, so that follows the, the top. Um, each piece that you're going to make will have a, its own little section like that. So that's really page one that you have to read. And you should read it for every pattern because 
Um, they can change things and you need to be aware of what they might have changed. Now, um, when we get over here to the capri pants and we're using pieces 16 and 17, it shows two different layouts. And again, uh, with 45 inch fabric without nap, three sizes, and then 45 inch fabric with nap for the rest of the sizes and 60 inch fabric for each of the size groups. And so that's basically you get your general notes, your um, marking information, your, your fabric layouts. Now here is more sewing information. And these are good to know anyway. Um, the right side of the fabric, the wrong side of the fabric, interfacing, right side of the lining, wrong side of the lining. Seam allowances. Use 5 eighths of an inch seam allowance unless otherwise indicated. How to trim and clip. Um, how to pin and fit. And really some pressing. Then they even have a glossary. Finish, narrow hem, slip stitch, top stitch. So all of that from the beginning to here, you really have to read for your item before you start. Then there will be directions for each individual item. And so that's the end of page one. And this is marked page three. I'm not sure. Um, and this is what we need on page three. The shorts or the capri pants. There are one, two, three, five steps. And I'm just going to show you uh, quickly what they are. You'll notice, if we go back to the fabric layout on any of these right here, these are your two pattern pieces. And that shape is good to remember for any kind of pants because this curved edge here is usually, I believe, the front. And there is a very simple way that pants go together. Sewing the front seam and then turning the legs slightly in another direction and then sewing the back seam is basically it. Now they start at the inner leg edges and I'm because there's only five steps I'm going to read you the five steps. It's a very simple pattern and that's what we're going to do anyway. Step one is stitch front and back together at inner leg edges. Two is Stitch center seam, matching notches and inside leg seam. Stitch again a quarter inch away in the seam allowance between the small circles. And if you look at this image, the small circles are like right there. So you're reinforcing the crotch area to do that. If I'm looking at that correctly, which I think I am, you're reinforcing right through here. And then you stitch the front and back together at the sides. And by that time, see this is your first seam right here that you stitched. But then when you stitch the center seam, you've actually turned the fabric a little bit. And your legs are over here. When you lay this out and do it, it, it it's not at all confusing. Then, uh, step four, turn the upper edge of the garment to the inside along the fold line, turning in a quarter inch on raw edges and press. Baste close to the turned in edge. Stitch along basting, leaving an opening to insert the elastic. So what you're basically making is a casing at the top of the pants. You're turning under a, a raw edge of a quarter inch 
and whatever the fold line amount is, it's probably um, an inch or an inch and a quarter, or something like that. So that's really almost like a fold over hem, only you're not making a hem, you're making a casing. And then you cut a piece of elastic, um, of elastic, cut a piece of elastic waist measurement plus one inch. Insert elastic through casing, lap the ends, which means just uh, fold one end over the other. Hold with the safety pin, try on garment and adjust elastic if necessary. Stitch ends of elastic securely. I'll show you that image. That's, um, it's a little blurry. Uh, what I do is, when I'm inserting elastic, I put a safety pin, on a big safety pin, through one end of the elastic. And I use that to push the pin through the casing. And because if you just keep pushing and you don't hold the other end, it'll just go all the way through, I pin the other end wherever um, the elastic has to end. So if I'm doing a casing starting right here, I pin one end of it right to the fabric somewhere. Then I put a safety pin on the other end and use the safety pin, a, a, a big safety pin, to push it through the casing. And that makes it go a lot quicker. Now, it doesn't look like they talk about hemming. Oh, I'm, I'll have a correction already. There are actually seven steps. Um, Stitch the opening in the casing, stretching elastic while stitching. I think that's at the, the end of the casing, it, um, at the seam where, where you're actually closing the casing. And then simple hemming. Turn up a one and a quarter inch hem on lower edge, baste close to fold, turn in a quarter inch raw edge, and press and then baste close to the turned in edge, stitch along upper basting. Now, I don't usually baste as much as they say in here, especially if I've either pinned or pressed the item. So, this gives you an overview of how simple it is to make basic elastic waist pants. And Almost all of the patterns are going to be similar, and it is worth reading the instructions, um, especially uh, even if you've made the item before and you kind of know what you're doing, it's still a good idea to go back and read them again. Now, I've uh, taped two wide pieces of wax paper together, and what I'm going to do now is open up the tissue, and don't let this... Um, don't let this dismay you. If, if you open this up, when you open one of these up, if it looks like an awful lot of information, it is. And it is big, and you'll probably never get it folded right again to go back in the envelope easily. But keep in mind that there are five or six pieces in this pattern that you can make. And to make the pants, we only need two of them. So I'm lucky I have this big um, work table I can work on. Normally, I open these up on the floor. What I'm going to do now is open up the full sheets, and then I'll show you how I'm going to trace the two pattern pieces onto the wax paper. There are actually several sheets here, which is not all that uncommon. Um, the, the pieces that I need are right here, 16 and 17. But what you will see is that um, there will be other pieces around them because what the companies have to do is get as many pieces on as few pieces of paper as possible. So this is the sheet that I need right here, but I also want to point out that the other sheets will be similar, where they will have a cutting line. Um, these are notches, 
that normally um, I cut pointing out instead of in. Over the years of sewing, you'll work out your own preferences. This is a good example of the information that's on there. It's piece number five with the pattern number. There's a grain line. Um, there are different, on this piece, you need different dots for different sizes. These are probably cutting lines for each side, size, 6, 8, 10, 12. Now, what I would do is, personally, I would cut out the whole entire piece and then fold it to the size that I needed. So, that's what these tissue paper pages are going to look like. And it is a lot of information. Each pattern piece will have whatever information you need for that particular piece. And um, we only need two pieces here. And tish the tissue paper is fairly delicate. And, but I don't need like piece number eight or 10 or six is down at the other end. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut out the entire piece of 16 and the entire piece of 17 and then I'll lay those flat on the table and put a piece of wax paper over each one and trace my size onto a wax paper pattern. If you were using brown paper or uh, newsprint paper you would have to, because it's not see-through, you would have to kind of place your paper on top of the, the pattern and lift it up, draw the line on your paper, lift it up, see where the line goes, draw it. It would be a little bit more difficult. Most people would have wax paper, um, but it can be done if you, have, if you want to use other papers too. So I am going to cut out from the tissue paper entire piece 17 and entire piece 16 and then trace my size onto wax paper for my general use. Then I will fold these tissue originals back up and put them in the envelope. When I, tr uh, when I trace them onto the wax paper I'm going to copy over as much of that information that I need. Um, back cut to so that I don't have to um, dig it out again, uh, dig the original out again the next time I use this to make something. Just to show you, those are all the other pages folded up again. So it's not really that bad. It just takes a minute to fold them back up. On the bottom are the spare pieces that were on the sheet of the two pieces I need. So, um, this will obviously all fit back in the envelope. I was kind of joking before. It just takes a minute or two to fold them all back up again. Now, I've used a green Super Sharpie marker to trace my size onto the wax paper. I have a few things written here. Um, one thing I want to point out, I'm making the Capri pants, as I said, so I've gone down as long as they have this in length. I've made a little mark for the hemline of the shorts and this is what they're calling the crotch line so I've made another mark there. There is also in the center here an area for lengthening or shortening that I don't think I'm going to need so I'm not marking it but if you were going to shorten the pants, then you end up folding this line to that line on the pattern. If you were going to lengthen them, I think you cut in between, add paper in between, and then cut your fabric out. So this is just, um, it doesn't take that long at all on this particular pattern. Some of the patterns I've done this with, it does take longer. But I've copied over what I'm going to need, such as where the notches are and everything. And now when I take that uh, tissue paper pattern out from underneath there, I can cut along 
this line all the way around and have um, more of a working pattern instead of um, using the tissue pattern all the time. Now another reason this is a good idea if um, if you're you I'm using one certain size in this pattern. If you have two or three women in your household, girls, women, teenagers, and you take different sizes, if you like if you cut to the smallest size, you lose these other markings. So by tracing for each size, you actually end up um, preserving the original so that you can make it in different sizes later if you want to. So I will cut this out and go ahead and trace the other piece and then start to sew. Of course, before I start stitching, I have to cut the fabric out. So I will trace this. I will then follow the guidelines on the pattern paper for laying out the fabric and the pattern pieces and then cut out the fabric according to how that layout comes out and at that point I'll be ready to start stitching.